we're good to go. Okay. Okay. Our speaker tonight is Dr. David Meyer. He got his bachelor's in geology at the University of Michigan and PhD at Yale. He is retired from the faculty on the geology department at the University of Cincinnati, where he taught invertebrate paleontology, paleoecology, geology and biology of coral reefs, historical geology, and dinosaurs. His research interests focus on fossil and living crinoids, coral reefs, paleo paleoecology, and taphonomy. He was one of the authors of this book, <laughs> a sea without fish and that is the title of his talk tonight dave okay well thank you all very much for inviting me and uh for uh uh signing on to this this uh program tonight and we'll we'll just uh, get started uh first off the title is the same as the title of the book that uh, richard davis and i published in uh, 2009 and it may be familiar, I hope, to, to a lot of you. Um, and the, the, the talk is gonna be derived from parts of that, of, of that, that uh, book, um, but we won't try to cover everything. So, so you, gotta, you still gotta read the book. Um, so this is uh, the cover of our book is part of a, a, a um, let me see, how do I get? How do I, okay, the next, uh, yeah. Um, frame is, is uh, the enlarged uh, painting on which the cover is, is based. It was uh, done by a man named John Agnew, who is an artist in Cincinnati, who has done a lot of wonderful natural history art, both uh, most, mostly about uh, living uh, organisms in, in the wild. And he very nicely did this, this painting for us. And, you know, I want to start out by saying, well, this, this is the title of the talk, and it, it may raise a lot of questions with, with, with readers, uh, people interested, as to just uh, uh, what, what do we mean by a sea without fish? I mean, this is kind of an unheard of uh, thing. Um, you know, are there, are there any such, such places or around or... Uh, uh, you know, just what does this mean? What do we mean by the sea without fish? And in the, the cover image here, we see uh, a scene, a colorful scene that John did. Uh, it looks like it's very shallow water, very shallow water. And you see creatures there. Uh, you see some, well, paleontologists and fossil collectors are gonna uh, see a lot of familiar things, nautiloids, they're gonna see trilobites, sea stars, crinoids, uh, brachiopods, bryozoans, um, uh, gel there's a jellyfish up in the corner. You you're not going to see any actual fish. So this is a depiction of the sea, the sea without fish. And we'll let's go on here. And here I've kind of written out what, uh, what will be kind of the plan for the talk and, and the questions that we want to answer. <clears throat> okay, we, so we know that the Earth's oceans have existed millions of years ago, and we're not going to go into all that kind of background evidence. But the question here to start is, have there always been fish and other creatures living in the oceans as they do now? What were they like? How has the life in the oceans changed over time, which we're talking about hundreds of millions of years? Um, and in North America, we have a, an incredible sedimentary rock record that, that uh, spans uh, the entire Phanerozoic and of course goes back into the Precambrian uh, that contained an abundant fossil record, at least uh, through the Phanerozoic, uh, as a record of past life in the seas that covered much of the North American continent when sea level was much higher than it is now. And we're going to focus on the Cincinnati Arch region of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, the tri-state region we call it here, <clears throat> in particular, uh, has bedrock, which is exposed at the surface in this region, which is loaded with abundant fossils. Uh, it, it amounts to about 100, 800 feet of limestone and shale that make up what is called the Cincinnatian series. 
And these strata are dated, as most of you probably understand, as late Ordovician in age, making them about 440 million years old. And we won't go in too much into, into the absolute dating uh, uh, st story here, but we're, we're going to uh, understand that, that these are really, really old. Some of the oldest known evidence of life in, in past these to be found anywhere on Earth. Uh, it, it, we're, we're really incredibly fortunate in this area to have these right under our feet, literally. So in this talk, we will learn what the fossils tell us about the life of the, what we call the Cincinnati Sea and compare it to the life in modern seas. Major question to try to answer in the time I have is, uh, how has the ecology of the seas changed over time? So there's a focus here on, on ecology, the, the relationship between the organisms and the environment of the past. And we're gonna start out by <clears throat> looking at, at uh, different components of the fossil abundance that we have here in Cincinnati. And uh, we start out actually with microfossils. And we're also going to uh, pr proceed in a, a kind of an ecological uh, fashion here, be because when we look at uh, microfossils in the local rocks, <clears throat> we find evidence of what constituted the, the plankton um, of, of the, the time of the Cincinnatian. And here is a figure that most of these figures are, are in our book, but um, uh, this was uh, done up by Robert Riding in a 2009 paper, and a uh, very interesting paper, where here he's, he's plotted on a time scale from the oldest at the left and then to the right up to the present uh, of uh, the components of the marine uh, phytoplankton that are known over time. And this has been something that's interested me for a long time as to just what the plankton was like. And I think we'll see why I might be so interested in, in uh, the, the, the plankton in, in the waters that existed. But we're gonna see that it, it's quite an interesting story for the, well, the whole Paleozoic, and especially for the Ordovician back here, uh, very, uh, you know, very early in the, uh, in the Paleozoic. And the, the plot here is showing the number of species known as fossils of, of these different groups. So we look at the Paleozoic record of plankton, phyto, plant plankton, al, microalgae in particular. And we have what are called acrotarchs. And, you know, that is the only component of the, the phytoplankton, really, that is well known in the fossil record, not necessarily the entire uh, con, con, uh, constituents of the plankton. There may have been things that weren't preserved. You have to remember this, but what was preserved? Well, acrotarchs are organic walled microfossils. Um, size here, I mean, these things are really, really, really tiny. And they, their extraction is highly specialized. I don't do it. I've never done it. Um, but but uh, uh, rocks are, are acidized um, with uh, hydrofluoric acid. Uh, these, these come out of shales. These are found in shales. And the very earliest ones are known are 1.7 billion years old in the marine uh, sedimentary record. And there were very, very few of them. Uh, in the late uh, part of the Proterozoic, there began to be some diversity showing up. And these were the only things, and, and these have many different forms. They look like little burrs or something. These are magnified in our book some 200 and some times or, or more even on the page. Uh, uh, the, these are very specialized uh, forms to study. But um, in the Paleozoic, their diversity became quite high. The, the different kinds of these things at, at what are termed to be species. And these were very abundant and thought to be 
major components of the phytoplankton. Well, what, what are acrotarchs? The, the name actually means unknown, uh, you know, un, unknown kind of mystery fossils, but they, they may be forms related to the dinoflagellates, which come along later. Well, okay, later in the, in the Paleozoic, they, they decline, they crash, they really crash. But we're interested here in the, in the Cincinnatian, back here, the Ordovician, in this part of the record, when they were very diverse. So they were supposedly a lot of the phytoplankton that was there. So they were uh, undergoing photosynthesis and they were the major stuff that's in the plankton. Other more familiar phytoplankton groups up here, like the dinoflagellates, you see their diversity is shown here in this plot. Well, they don't really come into the fossil record until after the Paleozoic. And so they're, they're very diverse and they, they fluctuate a lot. Uh, and today they're still important components of the marine phytoplankton. Coccolithophores, of course, these are a, green, a type of green algae that have the calcareous uh, test, um, uh, also part of the modern uh, phytoplankton and the diatoms. So these components, which most people uh, know to be in the plankton today, were not part of the Paleozoic plankton. So most of the Paleozoic record had, had none of the things in it that are feeding a lot of the creatures in the sea today at, at the micro scale, okay? So this, this is what we start with. Uh, what was the base of the food, food chain, the food pyramid? Uh, what did these things look like? All right, here from our book is a plate in which all uh, A through F, the upper half, are all microfossils. The acrotarchs here, and down here, a group called chitinozoans, which are equally mysterious. Uh, these are also organic microfossils. All these things are extracted by hydrofluoric acid out of either shales or limestones, and they're extremely tiny. The, the, the chitinozoans are kind of flask shaped kind of like little test tubes or flasks and are very, very diverse. Both of these things occur in the Cincinnati. Uh, workers at Ohio State uh, led, led by, uh, 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 well, let's see, don't get to Stig Bergstrom yet. Uh, people at Ohio State have, have studied these a lot and their students have extracted these all out of the Cincinnati and Ordovician rocks and have published on them and described them. Uh, it may be then again that the acrotarchs are the beginnings of things that became true dinoflagellates later on. Uh, the chitinozoans, what were they really? They may have actually been protozoans. Well, that would certainly take them out of the, chaos, the class of phytoplankton. Uh, they, they might have actually been, been uh, uh, single-celled organisms that constructed these little organic uh, tubes in which they lived and they were part of the plankton. But it's, there's a lot, still a lot of mystery in both of these groups as to what they actually were, but they were present too. Uh, but down here in the lower half, we have larger uh, forms that certainly were not plankton, they were bottom dwelling. So these were what we call benthic algae macroalgae, meaning they're larger. You can see my scale here in uh, millimeters is in a lot of the pictures. Um, but these two, uh, H and I, uh, th this is about the golf ball sized. Um, this is a very interesting thing that uh, has been related. Both of these types of things have been related to what are called DASI clads. And these are a major green algae group. They're basically, you know, call them seaweeds if you like, but they were, uh, uh, some of them were, were calcareous and uh, the DASI clads existed at the present time. So, so we've got uh, these things present. Um, 
and they were living on the bottom, but they're not very, very common, but they could have been a source of food for uh, different uh, larger animal life. Um, moving on up into larger things, what about sponges? Well, we certainly had sponges in the Cincinnati assemblage. Uh, there's a, a number of different forms. This is the largest a, a group called stromatoporoids. And these are very neat because they, they are not, were not really spongy, at least in, in the nature of their basal skeleton, which was calcium carbonate and, and uh, forming very, very fine laminations here, microscopically shown, and sometimes forming large, large domal masses, or even there are even some forms that were like uh, stalagmites, basically pillars growing up from the seafloor in the Ordovician. But these are now understood to have been sponges. And one of the key characters making them sponges have been these structures, these, these um, um, root-like uh, radiating branching uh, kind, of, kind of grooves with a central, central convergence here on, on uh, lumps that they formed under them. Um, these are called asterisi. And these are very similar to uh, what are called ex-current canal systems on living sponges. And, and uh, these, these uh, exist back in the, in the Cincinnati. Um, but they're, again, they're pretty restricted. They, these got very large. We, we just drove at uh, 70 miles an hour past a lot of them on I-75 down near Lexington uh, in the Lexington limestone, which is middle Ordovician. And those have uh, um, you know, quite a size, uh, a meter or so in wide, and and very, very uh, uh, a lot of calcification, not, not forming true reefs, but kind of uh, kind of a reef-like setting. Uh, moving on, we do have cnidaria, which include the corals. Of course, the living cnidarians are very important of the seas, in, uh, of great importance. Jellyfish. Uh, Sea anemones are the closest relatives of, of these uh, corals. Um, uh, the, there, there are uh, the jellyfish, the soft corals, the stony corals, the reef building corals uh, are all cnidarians. And in the Cincinnati, yes, we've got these forms, which everybody probably is familiar with, the uh, rugose corals, the horn corals, which were uh, present in the Paleozoic and can be found in the Cincinnati, but only in certain horizons. Uh, reconstruction in life shows that they had a, an anemone-like polyp uh, that was housed in this, this, cal, uh, this coral corallum, which is a term, and they either laid on their sides on the bottom or some, some might have been partly buried in and, and stood up like this, and they are thought to have had a ring of tentacles surrounding a mouth uh, by which they fed on, on uh, things that they captured, but, but not feeding on plankton, probably on larger, larger things. What were they, I wonder what these things were feeding on. Uh, we also have the related uh, tabulate corals, honeycomb, honeycomb corals in the Cincinnati. And, and these are colonial. The, the key thing about the tabulates is that they were colonial corals. Each, each element here housed a, an individual polyp, and these are, are uh, recognized by having uh, radiating septa. They're also tabulates because in the cross section, we see the horizontal uh, kind of ladder-like appearance of individual um, coralites, as each of these is called, as it, as it grew from the, the ancestral colony. Uh, through time, and these budded, multiplied, and each of these tabulae supported the soft polyp as the thing grew. And these also make large, pretty large colonies in certain parts of our, our uh, Cincinnati record. So there were corals, but were they reefs? No. I don't think we're going to have time for this uh, to develop this. You might want to question me about this. But the Cincinnati and Sea was not a, a big place for actual coral reefs to form. 
Uh, this uh, intrigued me a lot. In uh, Madison, Indiana, in a park, a local park, you can find this shed that is actually built of these colonial corals. You can see the hemispherical or spherical um, um, shapes here that form the building blocks of this neat little tool shed. Uh, these were collected uh, from streams and uh, road cuts uh, near, uh, near Madison out of the Cincinnati and from which they, they uh, are eroded. Uh, but they're coming from pretty restricted zones up in the, in the Richmondi in the upper part of the Cincinnati. And of course here is a living modern coral, a form called Tubastria, a tube coral uh, that you, you can find living in the Caribbean. Um, but the, the rugose corals, the horn corals are extinct. So are the tabulates. They became extinct at the end of the Paleozoic, but they were already present back in our Ordovician time. And here we see uh, extended uh, polyps with their tentacles. Uh, they, these forms uh, extend them mostly at night. In the daytime, they pull them back, the polyp back into the coralite, tuck it right down in there, and they look like this during the daytime. So, but but these again are are actually sclerotinian corals. They are they are not. Um, they have a different structure. They are they are not the same group uh, evolutionarily as as these Paleozoic forms. Um, but now, of course, we get to the Bryozoans. We get to another colonial group of organisms that's extremely abundant in the Cincinnati. And anyone who has uh, fossil collected in the Cincinnati knows a lot about Bryozoans, or maybe more than they would like to, to know about. Uh, but they are a major uh, component of the fossil fauna here. Uh, entire limestones are formed of their skeletal fragments. So the Bryozoans are big rock formers in the Cincinnati. Uh, they, in, in, in the ecology of the sea of the Ordovician, they were forms that, that uh, gave us a lot, a lot of the uh, framework of, of the habitat. Uh, and and uh, um, this, this was uh, of major importance as providing a lot of uh, complexity of the, of the uh, bottom and, and uh, a lot of living space for many other creatures, a lot of cracks and crannies, uh, great diversity of forms, a lot of branching forms. A lot of these resemble very closely many living bryozoans. Uh, these are entire colonies that, that you, can, you can find. And the little scale here in each of these four is about two centimeters. But this one, look at this one. This is a remarkable thing. This is a, a kind of a, a folios or, or um, um, platy, however you want to describe it, uh, growth form. And this entire thing was excavated out by Ron Fine, a member of the dry dredgers who is an amazing, interesting collector who has collected these in situ and reassembled them from their pieces. And this one is 65 centimeters wide, really large. And of course, wouldn't be the full size of this. So this is what I mean by, you know, making a framework for habitat. And in amongst these things, we find lots of fossils uh, of other things that lived in with these. These were the nooks and crannies. These were like, virtually like corals. I mean, the, these forms up here were massive, a very, very, the size of a bowling ball. Here's a fascinating thing. It was an encrustation over a large nautiloid cephalopod that grew, grew across a, a shell lying on the seafloor. And this is a big, thick, these are the trepostomes. Uh, all, all these belong to the trepostome bryozoans, which are extinct, but we have living counterparts. And here's one of my favorite forms, uh, a living bryozoan, not phylogenetically related to the Ordovician ex extinct forms, <clears throat> but still showing you the same kind of a growth habit. A, 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 this little colony here would fit in the palm of your hand. I took this picture in the cold waters of the Pacific Northwest. 
and it's it's a, a, a cyclostomate type of bryozoan, which which uh, is found in the fossil record, but not in the Ordovician. Came along later, but there's a lot of evolutionary convergence in the colony forms that we get. So we can see a lot of similarity to the forms that existed in the Cincinnatian. Uh, here's a little bit on the, the, what we call the soft anatomy of a bryozoan. Some of them don't have any calcareous skeleton, but these in all these forms, there's a kind of a tube in, into which the uh, organism, each member of the colony called a, it's not a true polyp, but it's like that. It has uh, a mouth, tentacles that extend, and then a gut leading down into the, the interior body where all the soft parts, the uh, rest of the soft parts are located. And the food, suspended food, because these are filter feeders, like the uh, sponges we've already seen, that uh, uh, capture their food, take it in and uh, digest and then spit out their waste material here. So, so uh, uh, you know, very important uh, feeding type in the Cincinnati, of course, is that of the filter feeder or suspension feeder. So these would have been feeding on plankton or organic particles in the water derived from that plankton or other sorts. And we've got scads of species of bryozoans. Uh, but we've also got brachiopods galore. And I'm sure all you collectors know what brachiopods are. And here's uh, two plates from our book showing some of the diversity of the brachiopods in the Cincinnati. Brachiopods are not mollusks, but yet they, they have uh, bivalve shells, two valves. Uh, these forms are all the forms we call articulates, which uh, had a, a hinged, a hinged uh, connection between the two valves, also um, uh, made, made more secure by uh, teeth, cardinal teeth that fit into sockets, and the shells open and closed with the aid of musculature, which we can see beautifully um, leaving a record here in the muscle scars. And also a lot of these were forms that attached by means of a pedicle, a fleshy stalk, which is found in living brachiopods of, of the most common types. The, the articulate bracts are still living today in seas. Uh, so they form an interesting analog that we can study to see uh, what the Paleozoic forms uh, might've been like. But this, this form would have had a, a functional pedicle. Uh, some of these guys here may be also a, a functional pedicle through an opening. But some of these had a, a pedicle opening that was extremely small or basically closed off in the adult stages. And so they, they might have been just free lying on the bottom, uh, uh, not, not attached. A very, very common form of brachiopod in the Cincinnati, and of course, is represented by this type here, the genus Raffinescana. And these belong to the thin shelled forms that had uh, the two valves that kind of nested together like two saucers. Uh, and what we, each valve being kind of a concavo convex uh, form. And here we see the same species probably with the convex valve uh, showing here next to one that is flipped over and shows the concave uh, brachial valve. And, and here we see, this is the interior of this valve here where we see the muscle scars and such. And this is the interior of the pedicle valve, which has the big pedicle opening and, and really big muscle scars. Um, these formed shell pavements, which is probably a very important component of the, the bottom uh, structure along with the bryozoans. Uh, sometimes covering entire beds like this, oftentimes uh, uh, disturbed by storms, turned up onto edgewise beds like this. And these uh, type of brachiopods are very, very uh, popular as uh, substrates to be encrusted by many uh, other forms, which we'll see 
that are epi, epizoans or epibiotic forms. But these, most of these probably were lying free on the sea floor, on the soft sediments. There's been a lot of controversy about, well, which way was up? Which way was, the, I mean, this is the upper surface of a bed and you've got uh, both, both uh, uh, you've got articulated valves here. One is concave valve up, this is convex valve up. And notice the encrusters, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, each, each real asteroids, okay? So, and here is an interesting one I, I want you to see of, of Arafinescina uh, that um, uh, is uh, on an upper surface of a limestone bed, okay? And here you see the, the hinge would be along here. This is the convex upward pedicle valve. And yet around this margin, notice that there is a kind of a, a groove, which Ben Dottillo and I have started to call a moat, a moat. So whether you like that term or not, um, that's what we have used for this, a moat, which we have found. And you know, at first blush, when you see this, you think, oh, well, it's a compactional feature that the shell got compressed by being buried, perhaps before it was petrified, and that the edge of the valve pushed in like a cookie cutter to make this, this so-called moat. But I think this specimen has, well, you can see it's got two encrusters right on the edge. And these are the Idrio asteroids, which we'll talk more about. These are echinoderms. They live, I mean, they're kind of like barnacles, really, but they're, they're no, no barnacle, that's for sure. And we find them oftentimes growing right along the edge of this type of brachiopod. But the very fact that this one has these beautifully preserved Idrios, we call them for short, um, on the edge of this host shell, that is, it is down in this, this moat thing. And also these two guys sort of uh, collapsed and, and slumped partly. I, I think they lived their lives like this, but after death, they, they kind of get collapsed. Their innards get, get uh, uh, decomposed and, and the plating uh, sags and they end up like this. But I think this specimen shows that they were living on the edge of this shell when this structure we call the moat existed. And Ben Dottillo and I hypothesized that this moat is formed by the brachiopod itself. It's, it's, it's not a, a burrow per se, but it's, it's evidence that the, the creature lived a long time in that position and uh, opened its valve for feeding. And thanks to some really elegant research that Ben Dottillo has done, and Ben is a professor at uh, Indiana, you know, Purdue University in Fort Wayne, um, these things could open up almost 90 degrees. The, the gape angle on the hinge of this thing can be shown to be about 90 degrees. So we argue that these Echinoderms were in life position, and this was the, the host shell was probably alive because the most of these, almost all the ones that are like this, are uh, two two valves together. They're not they're not broken apart. Uh, here's here's a living brachiopod. Brachiopods still live, and this little guy is one that is interesting because the the uh, pedicle valve on this one is definitely against the substrate because these little guys cement the pedicle valve to the underside of, of stony corals in modern reefs. The, this is recent. And it, it looks like a little, uh, looks like a little commode, doesn't it? And this looks like the, the, the flap of the toilet seat, doesn't it? But, but this is the brachial valve that when they're opened almost 90 degrees, you see the filaments of the feeding structure called the lophophore. And, and uh, this, this group here is a group that survives to the present. 
and is, is found in the Caribbean. Uh, and and uh, these, these are the structures by which they take in water, they filter it, and they are filter feeders too. So brachiopods are still living. They are not as diverse as they were. And we, we certainly don't have forms around like these anymore. We don't have these, these thin-shelled uh, strophominates, but they were very, very major components of the Cincinnatian. Uh, but we also have another group called inarticulate brachiopods. Uh, they, not inarticulate in that they, well, they, none of them could speak, they were articulate, but, they, but the inarticulates lacked a, a rigid, rigid uh, skeletal uh, connection between the two valves. And here we have forms like lingulids that are practically, a, if you want to call something a living fossil, this is it. This is almost identical to the, the shell form of the living lingula brachiopod, which burrows into the sediment. And this is one a remarkable specimen from the Cincinnatian that was found like this um, on the edge, vertical. This, this is the edge of a, of a bed. And, and this thing was found there, and it would have had a long pedicle coming out of this, this end that didn't that went went down into the sediment, and this could probably um, open up uh, at the sediment water interface for feeding. So this this is a form very very similar uh, to to uh, living forms, or, or the the fossil is the living forms are very similar to these Ordovician. Uh, ancestors and they are lingulates. We also have these these little cap shaped brachiopods that are inarticulous. They were also encrusters, and they too have recent species, which again are are not uh, the, the you know that close evolutionarily, but they're the same major groups of inarticulates uh, are around today, and they live the same way. So we've got those type of brachiopods. Uh, let us go to the mollusks. The mollusks, of course, extremely important in the fossil record uh, through time. And, and uh, uh, we, we have uh, many, many uh, mollusks in the Cincinnatian. So there's a lot of interest in what they were like. Here, we mainly, we look only at clams. A and B here are clams um, of, of the Cincinnatian. This this pair here, this is a, a, a attached uh, valves of, of a form very much like middleus, the, the muscle, modern muscles. These are ancestors of those groups. Here's a form that is again in probably preserved in life position, a burrowing type of clam or bivalve, uh, kind of like over here in the diagram. Uh, these forms here that were probably burrowing, but not very deeply into the, the sediment. A lot of, as you see, these forms here are burrowers, but they did not burrow very deeply, okay? They probably uh, were able to either use siphons or their gape would open up enough so that they could uh, uh, pump in water currents and, and uh, extract uh, uh, organic detritus um, from, from it for feeding. Uh, other forms lived, uh, well, well, C and D are the, uh, belong not to the true clams, but to an extinct group called rostroconchs. Rostroconchs were kind of uh, pseudo bivalve. They, they had two shells, but they didn't open and close. They had a, 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 a firm hinge attachment. Uh, there aren't any shown here, but they are found in the uh, in the Cincinnati and two. So we've got all these different types of clams in the Cincinnati, and, and many of these are living very much like um, clams do today. Uh, they they live on the surface. They are attached. Probably they had bissel threads, which this this guy probably did too. Uh, to, uh, by which muscles attach to uh, things on the seafloor. 
others attached within things like bryozoan colonies. There's the bryozoans being a, 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 a nice place for these to live. Others uh, would be on hard grounds, perhaps. <clears throat> there were clams that did probably live on the surface uh, and may, might have used their siphons to collect organic uh, food material from the sediment, surface feeders. But others did burrow in, uh, but not very deeply, okay? You've got shallow burrowers. These would be what you call infaunal. These up here living right on the bottom were called epifaunal. So many of these molluscan uh, life habits were established in the Ordovician as demonstrated by the uh, incredible contributions by the late John Pagetta, who was a good friend of mine and, and a tremendous, tremendous researcher on, on the Ordovician bivalves clams. And he also, he with uh, Runegar uh, described the rostrocox as, as a separate class of mollusks and they are extinct, okay? So, uh, now, oh, guess what? We're going to jump into my favorite group, the echinoderms, the crinoids, uh, which most of you probably know from your fossil collecting. And we've got a rich record of crinoids in the Cincinnatian. Uh, sometimes they're incredibly beautifully preserved. This specimen here is in the Smithsonian. It was illustrated in 1873 by Meek, one of our pioneer paleontologists of Ohio. Uh, just an amazing complete specimen of a stemmed crinoid. And here is a reconstruction, again made uh, by John Agnew, of a familiar Ordovician form, uh, Glyptocrinus. And here the form is one that we know attached by wrapping its stalk around things like bryozoans. The position of this is derived from our studies of living crinoids, stalked crinoids. And the next picture is an amazing scene that uh, is still available to be visited and observed and studied in really deep water in places like the Straits of Florida. This, this site is basically between the, the Bahamas and the east coast of Florida and Miami, Fort Lauderdale, that coast. It, this, this is right off. This site is right off uh, uh, Grand Bahama Island in four, over 400 meters of water. And a, a good colleague and friend of mine, Chuck Messing, has uh, gone down in submersibles. You cannot free dive, scuba dive. You certainly can't scuba dive. If you're a free diving, you're, you're, you're a very specialized diver. I don't know whether any diving can be done by free divers at that depth. Certainly not this kid. Uh, but stalk crinoids live down there today. Now these are again evolutionarily very advanced compared to uh, anything uh, you know from the Cincinnati, which are all extinct. But it was from these that we learned how these things live. That they they stand up above the bottom up to a meter high. They form what we call parabolic filtration fans, and they bend the arms. They tilt their crown over. They bend the arms back into the current. So the current is, is going from the bottom toward the top of the frame. You can see ripple marks in the sand here. These are stuck on a, a, a hard ground underneath with the attachments there. And they spread out into this fan. that's like a, a, like a, 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 a radar uh, screen, uh, like a catcher's mitt however you want to describe it, and they, they intercept the current going through, and this efficiently captures the, the flow and enables them to be more efficient uh, suspension feeders. And this we see in the shallow water feather stars that don't have stalks, and we see it in these forms as well. So these were, this is a look back into the past, uh, almost identical forms to forms that existed in the Mesozoic but certainly not in the Paleozoic. Um, here's, here's one of these forms, a, a Cincinnati crinoid here with its calyx. Its stalk would come out here, its arms here, 
And here we've got a we've got a three phylum uh, trifecta here. We've got a crinoid with a snail, a gastropod, right on the top of its crown, possibly feeding on uh, fecal matter from the crinoid as a host. This is a cyclonema, very, very common in the Cincinnati and very often in this association. The little guys on the shell of the cyclonema are corneolites. They are little, little uh, tubular things. They're not corals, but they're kind of like little encrusting corals might be, but they, they were uh, also uh, a, a, um, a form that, that probably was a filter feeder as, as well that we get as this is where we have evidence of interactions probably uh, definitely occurred during life of the these species, biotic interactions. And, and these are some of the very oldest known out of the entire fossil record in the, the Cincinnati, the association between the clam and the crinoid as some kind of a host. Some of the clams, or I'm sorry, some of the snails, gastropods, were actually predatory on the crinoid host, but maybe in the Ordovician, it's it's hard to say that these snails were not eating the fecal matter of the crinoid, which came out at, at the, on their surface of their crown like this. Okay, so uh, then we've got other echinoderms uh, in the Cincinnati that are very interesting. The echoasteroids, the the name kind of means seat stars. Now, these do not have a separate stalk. Instead, they're kind of barnacle-like, as I showed you previously. They form sort of a blister-like or barnacle-like uh, body form that attaches onto something like a brachiopod shell, or it attaches onto just a substrate, a, a hard ground, uh, or a bivalve or something like that, or even the stem of a live, perhaps a living crinoid. This, this guy's kind of wrapped around the stem of the crinoid. And these, these uh, echinoderms are extinct. They went out in the Permian, finally. But in the Cincinnati, this, this slide got kind of messed up here. It wasn't supposed to be this large. But, but this shows the detail of the surface of one of these. They had five uh, food grooves that converged on this, what was thought to be the central mouth under these, these plates. And it's quite likely that the plates, boy, I'm jumping all over here. Uh, the plates lining the food groove could open up as kind of zipper-like. And it is thought that they probably possess uh, tube feet like living echinoderms by which they captured food and channeled it to the central mouth. Uh, so these were filter feeders also. Uh, their waist came out through this opening here, kind of a valve-like anal opening. And, and these are, are found in the Cincinnati and, and are, are uh, especially found on these shell pavements. Okay, now we get to, we get to uh, some big favorites for all fossil collectors, trilobites. Uh, we've got lots of nice trilobites in the Cincinnati. I can see I'm over 45 minutes now, but we're going to get close to the, the end of this pretty quickly. Uh, trilobites are, I call the hands down favorite of collectors, of course. How did they live? What was their ecology? What was their feeding habits? Uh, we get them enrolled, the flexicolimony, or we get them prone. Uh, we, we get them beautifully preserved like this, or we get lots of, of fragments of the, the trilobites. We also get incredibly rare and spectacular specimens like this specimen here collected by Dan Cooper and prepared uh, Allolycus as kind of a, a not really spine, well, kind of spiny, but, but a form that even shows what could be preserved color markings. What actual color it was in life or what function it served, we don't know. But this specimen has a different kind of marginal uh, pigmentation that somehow got preserved. It's, it's an amazing fossil. Um, and then we have the giant fossil of the trilobites in the Cincinnati, the Isotelus, 
which has been named the state fossil of Ohio. Of course, we've got to have that. This specimen itself measures 37 centimeters and is in the collections of the Cincinnati um, Museum of, of Natural History. Uh, and these are found in the Cincinnati and they were very large. It is quite possible that the isotelus and some of the other trilobites were actually predatory. And here is a trace fossil that is a burrow formed by isotelus. We, we know this to be true because of the size, the great size of this. It matches some of the isotelus that we get preserved as body fossils. This is a, a, a hypo relief. It's a trace fossil that's showing on the, the, the sole or the bottom of a bed. And it, it, it's a cast really of its burrow, which somehow even miraculously was preserved. And even more miraculously, I found this one. This is the best darn trace fossil I ever picked up uh, was at a, a site in Cincinnati, which produced a, a great many beautiful trace fossils. Uh, Richard Osgood, a PhD at, at Cincinnati under Ken Caster, uh, studied these and became a great uh, pioneer in the study of Cincinnati and trace fossils. It, it has got traces of their the burrowing, the legs of the trilobite, impressions of the dorsal shield, the, or yeah, the, the, the tail shield, the margins, the uh, pleury here, and the cephalon again, in kind of a cookie cutter fashion, uh, left these traces. And then most amazingly is this burrow, which looks very much to me as if it was uh, right up by the, where the mouth of the trilobite would have been. And uh, we hypothesized in a paper that did get published that this may be the, the evidence of a trilobite killed in the act of uh, going after its prey, uh, a worm perhaps. This is a worm burrow. This is not the only case of this to be known from the fossil record. Some have been found in the Cambrian, they're found in the, in the Silurian, uh, in the uh, uh, formations down in Kentucky. Another thing you want to understand about trilobites is that this plate called the hypostome, which was associated with the mouth on the underside is quite large in isotelus and it was forked like this. The mouth probably was located here. And, and these types of hypostomes were attached to the head shield underneath uh, its, its uh, front margin. And study of these has indicated that, that they might've supported different kinds of food habits. Um, I kind of liken this thing to a cutting board that the trilobite could have held on to some of its uh, food, small organisms that it captured, and uh, used its appendages against this as kind of like a cutting board to chew, macerate the prey, and then move it into the mouth here. And so that's the hypothesis, but but it's it's being revealed that a lot of these trilobites, even the flexicolimides, might have been predators. Uh, other predators we get to include the eryptorids found in the Cincinnati. More, uh, much better known from the Silurian above, of course, but in the Cincinnati, an incredible thing was found here, the Megalograptus, uh, this guy uh, reaching lengths of over half a meter and some most incredible specimen that became the type that uh, Ken Caster and Eric Waring described uh, that was found by a, a, a University of Cincinnati student working a summer job uh, along the road cuts, found these specimens, which are in the museum center's collections, uh, the, the type material. And this guy was, was a, a very important type of uh, early eryptorid that was had. And so this would have been a swimmer, not a fish, but probably an active mobile predator, a mega predator of the Ordovician. 
what about these? More echinoderms, starfish, sea stars, okay? This, look at this thing. This, this is one side of the fossil. This is flipped over and it's, it's the same fossil from the, the upper side of the starfish. It looks like a starfish you picked up at the shore today and brought home and dried out and smelled bad, but it doesn't smell bad anymore. But it's, it's a holotype in the Harvard Museum. And here are other forms that are from the Cincinnati. And the most incredible thing is this right here. This is the fossil of a Cincinnati sea star with its arms holding a clam in, in the predatory mode of starfish, even today, uh, caught in the act of of wrapping and, and, and uh, opening up a clam for feeding. So these were predators back then. Uh, here's a form with real flexible, uh, it's kind of strap-like arms. Here are other forms that look an awful lot like a lot of modern uh, predatory starfish. So these were predators then. Uh, we've got, of course, the cephalopods, which uh, uh, participants tonight like John Catalani know very, very well. Uh, cephalopods, the nautiloids in the Cincinnati. We've got the orthoconic straight shelled forms. We've got coiled forms, look just like a modern nautilus, and we're just about the same size. And we've got these odd uh, certiconic or slightly curved forms that, that uh, were in the Cincinnati, particularly in the upper Cincinnati, the Richmondian uh, stage saw an invasion from elsewhere of diverse predators belonging to the, the nautiloids. Um, a man who received his PhD at Cincinnati in 1942 was Russo Flower, a very interesting character in paleontology, studied nautiloids. And he came up with the idea that these things uh, had to counterbalance the, their long conical shells by depositing extra extra calcium carbonate within the, the chambers uh, that, that had been early formed in the, in the growth of the animal. And that enabled them to, to, uh, to uh, keep, keep themselves counterbalanced, uh, whereas the chambers are otherwise pr probably being filled with, with gas the way that the empty chambers of the Nautilus are. And if they hadn't had that, they, they probably couldn't have uh, lived to this horizontal uh, position. They would have been uh, uh, bottom, bottom heavy. They would have had their heads down all the time and they wouldn't have been very happy according to Rousseau's comical reconstruction here. So they, they got an attitude uh, with, with this uh, calcification that enabled them to be quote happy. They probably didn't smile like that, of course. So, so these were predators too, and they were mobile. They were planktonic. All right, now lastly, we get to things that might've actually been vertebrates. And there we go back to the microfossils. We've got loads of conodonts in the Cincinnati. And these also studied a whole lot at Ohio State by Professor Stig Bergstrom, uh, Professor Walt Sweet, and, and many of their students uh, worked on Cincinnati and conodonts which are extracted from the limestones by acetic acid uh, solution. These are, are uh, image, beautiful images uh, uh, provided to us by uh, Stig Bergstrom himself. Uh, these are scanning electron micrographs. Uh, on a page, these little guys are magnified over 200 times to, to get on the page. So. So I don't have the scale right here, but they were real tiny. They are now thought to be actual vertebrates, water conodonts. Were they fish? No. The animal that bore all these things, presumably like teeth somehow, has been discovered from the, the Carboniferous. Um, exactly how it lived, I, I'm not sure that's completely res resolved. The conodon animal was probably free swimming, but it, these things were not 
the fish that we know today. They were very, very small, but they were prevalent in the Cincinnati and Sea. Are there any true fish in the Ordovician time? Yes, okay. So the title of our book applies mainly to the Cincinnati and in, in the tri-state region. It can't be applied globally because here we have a reconstruction of uh, a jawless fish from the Ordovician in Colorado, from the Harding sandstone, very, very famous fossil, um, which has these uh, dermal plates, which are the forerunners of the bony fish skeleton, but the, the creature had no internal uh, fish bone skeleton. This was a, uh, an astracoderm, a bottom feeder uh, that, that was uh, around in the Ordovician. Other material has been found in uh, Bolivia, uh, other parts of the world, they were, they were present in the Ordovician. So not found in the Cincinnati Arch region yet. When they are, we've, I guess it's time for a new edition of the book with a different title. But um, the, the Cincinnati uh, fauna, when it's put together, and uh, I'm gonna have to wind this up, but, but people have tried to reconstruct what the whole assemblage looked like in dioramas that were first made back in the 1950s. So we can see a lot of these life habits as they were understood then. But now uh, we have some changes we can make. This is a beautiful uh, artistic reconstruction done by uh, Annie Castor and uh, Elizabeth Dalve, who was an illustrator in, in our department and the museum. And it shows that we had bottom dwellers, the trilobites, the brachiopods, the bryzoa uh, of different kinds here, bryzoa. There were things swimming around in the water like the nautiloids, like the graptolites. I haven't even talked about graptolites. Uh, and the crinoids were extending up uh, into the water column. And here, the old diorama that was based on knowledge from the mid 20th century, uh, it still exists at the museum and was restored and exhibited recently at the museum center, which with uh, comparisons of how these things were regarded in those days. And then some knowledge here about how we now regard the life habits of things like say crinoids. They, they, they didn't look just like flowers growing up from the bottom. They looked like the pictures I showed you from, from the deep sea. Uh, it, it's a lot of these, these graptolites probably didn't, didn't uh, flo uh, float around with, with floats on them like that, but some of them were probably pelagic. Others lived on the bottom and many, things of the science has changed how these would be made today, okay? And uh, the way we do this now, this is gonna be the wind up here, is that a concept called the guild has been used to try to put together all the creatures we find in a fossil assemblage in terms of a, a food web. You know what uh, food webs, food pyramids are? Well, uh, a good uh, friend of mine, Richard Bombach, uh, came up with the idea of the guild uh, to be applied to these fossil assemblages. A guild, this has been defined by ecologists as a group of species that utilize the same resources, food, space, and so forth in a similar way. So they will have different, the same sort of feeding preferences perhaps using different methods, perhaps similar methods, and forming a guild. Uh, the concept kind of relates to the idea of the guild as established back in the Middle Ages. And the way we assign guilds is based on parameters like this. Where does the creature live? How does it occupy space? Okay, that you, you can have an axis here. Do, do the animals live on the bottom on the surface moving around as epifauna, do they burrow into it, either shallow or deep? Do they, do they burrow actively or passively? 
or are they swimmers? Do they swim as the necton do, or do they drift passively like as the plankton do? So that defines your spatial component. The food source component is what, what are they getting as food and where are they getting it? Are they getting a suspended? We saw that a lot of the Cincinnati and fauna were filter feeders, suspension feeders. So they were getting suspended matter, plankton, detritus, out of the water mass here. And, uh, or were they, were they feeding on the bottom? Were they getting detritus, organic matter on the bottom? Or were they predators? Were they uh, catching things uh, right on the bottom by moving around? Uh, the last component, the bow plon, is refers to di different characteristics of individual forms, uh, their, their life history, their growth, and their physiology. And these things enable you to locate different species in gills in different parts of what we term eco space. All right. Now, to wind up here, something that, that bears some, some examination, but we have used this concept to place our Cincinnati and creatures into what are termed mega guilds. Mega guilds are big, sort of broad guilds that are defined by uh, the, the, the living position on the bottom, in the bottom sediment burrowing, or in the water mass above it. So either in fauna, epifauna, or pelagic. And then we define the food source like this and the, and the feeding type. Uh, filter feeders or suspension feeders, plant feeders, herbivores, meat eaters, carnivores. And of course, everything is based on the primary producers. And so this is something that we did uh, and some other workers have, have also done for the Ordovician is to try to fill in a grid like this with things that we know from the fossil record, how they lived. Everything I've just told you gets, gets summed up in diagrams like this, and this is the result. And the question to look here at is, what are the empty cells, or which would represent broadly ecological niches uh, that existed in the Ordovician? Well, there's empty cells here among the infauna, the burrowers, uh, the deposit feeders weren't around. Uh, they either were shallow uh, burrowers or deep burrowers, active burrowers. And we, we didn't have much deep burrowing by uh, clams or bivalves uh, in the Cincinnati. And most of the burrows we find are pretty shallow. Uh, deposit feeders were uh, some of the clams, as we said, also worms. We really didn't say anything about those. And some carnivores were were probably worms as they are today. But look at the cells that are really heavily occupied. They're the filter feeders, the suspension feeders, all these groups here that we talked about. Uh, some of them are, are uh, mobile, moving around, trilobites, uh, sea stars, snails, uh, other, other groups. And uh, some of them might have been eating uh, plant matter like the uh, seaweeds, the snails, and their relatives. Uh, some of them could have been predators. Uh, what about the water column? Pretty empty. Uh, only one known group of prime, surely more things must have been uh, at the base of that food chain. And we just don't know much about those. But there were things, predators like the cephalopods, the eryptorids, maybe some of the trilobites. The trilobites, uh, some of them were thought to be free swimmers or pelagic forms. Conodonts may be down here too. So this is what we can do to make a Ordovician version of this, which is done for the recent marine environment. And you just look at what you, you get for a recent shallow marine uh, mega guild uh, reconstruction. You, you get most of the cells filled. Well, you don't get a deep, you don't get things past just digging in the sediment and sitting there and feeding. They're, they're not going to get much. They're certainly not going to capture much if they're predators. So these are uh, empty, and they're basically the only ones that are pretty empty. 
uh, evolution has populated all these different cells of such a diagram. And so we can see that the Ordovician was anything, nothing like this modern shallow sea that of course is loaded with bony fish. These didn't come along until starting in the Silurian, the Devonian of course, and the later Paleozoic. And the fish have made a huge difference in the ecology of the shallow seas. And these were not around in the Ordovician in any form like this, okay? And we can take a slab from the Cincinnatian and I'll tell you that, that on this one slab, there were five phyla, brachiopods, mollusks, clams, trilobites, that's three. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, crinoid stems on here, very small, but they're there. So echinoderms were, were another one. And uh, oh yeah, bryozoans, of course, they're, they have to be there. There's the bryozoans. So five different phyla on a single slab like this yeah, represents a typical diversity. That's it, folks. Uh, sorry if it went a little over. I'd be happy to entertain any questions or if you want to uh, email me with any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them uh, um, in, in uh, due time. So thank you very much for your, your kind attention. And thank you, Dave. Uh, I hope we understand a little bit more about the sea without fish and why we call it that. Okay. <laughs> if you're open to it, Dave, uh, we probably have a bunch of questions. Okay, well, fire away and I'll do the best I can. Uh, Dave? Like I've got one uh, one little comment yeah. uh, for, cep for cephalopods, at least we found in the Mohawkian, that you could actually place cephalopods in three additional uh, places on the guild. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, some of the brevicones floated and were uh, planktonic uh, filter feeders. Yeah. Some of them, the small ones on the ocean floor, were <clears throat> grazers with their radula grazing on uh, algae. Uh, and uh, there were probably some that were actually processing the mud, like some of the gastropods did. Right. Uh, uh, kind of a wide variety because of the, like you were talking about the bowel plan, there's a wide variety of, of cephalopod bowel plans. Sure. Uh, although they, you know, obviously they're all similar with the septa and the siphuncle and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. And, and you know, it, it suggests that maybe, you know, the cephalopods at that time were filling a lot of niches, if you want to refer to them that way, that the fish have subsequently kind of taken over. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, a lot of cephalopods uh, were, were doing all these different things. I, I think that's a really uh, a good, good comment, John. Thank you very much. And, um, uh, you know, incredible diversity there. And we don't know, you know, the whole story on a, on a lot of this, but but this is the kind of picture that we we tried to sum up our our uh, presentation of the Cincinnati and creatures in the sea without fish. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. what about the sea scorpion and the jellyfish? Okay. Well, what about the the jellyfish that would have been in the Ordovician? Yeah, and the sea scorpion. C. C. Scorpion, you do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the jelly, you know, there, there may, have, there probably were jellyfish in the Ordovician. I think there are fossils of those. There, there have been some things in the Cincinnatian uh, first described as jellyfish, a form that looks like concentric circles, markings on the rock, was thought to be a jellyfish but it's a, a burrow. So some of these have been uh, interpreted in other ways. Um, and and the, uh, I still don't quite understand what your, your other example was, C. The Eurypterids, you know, sea scorpions. Oh, oh, sure, sure, the Eurypterids. Well, yeah, well, well they were definitely probably predators uh, that form Megalograptus had some strange spiny appendages uh, that looked like great rakes. And, you know, I kind of wondered if maybe those things, uh, you know, used those to kind of rake through the sediment to, uh -huh. to uh, 
pull up things and then ingest them. Uh, they, I mean, they were surely predators and they were fish-like also. And of course, in the Silurian, they diversified a lot. But the, the form in the Cincinnati is one of the earliest uh, Eurypterids known in, in the fossil record. And it's, it's just, just an amazing thing. Uh, of course, and these were the uh, forerunners of, of uh, scorpions that, that made it out of, out of the sea and onto land. Uh, leading to things things like the the spiders and and uh, terrestrial scorpions, uh, sure. But but you know we, we just don't have any any fish. We we don't have any plates of these uh, 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 bony these. I'm sorry these these uh, astracoderms, these earliest known fish uh, that have been found in places like Colorado. Uh, those don't show up as uh, microfossils here. They might, they just might. Uh, there's always new things to be discovered. You know, and a single fossil can, can. Uh, Dave, Dave I, was up at, I was up at Colorado at the Springs. Yeah. And yeah. The la that last road cut as you go up the, the hill to the to Royal Gorge. Yeah. Um, you can find some of the uh, phosphatic that are in, in red beds. Do you think? Possibly that the fish at that time could have been fresh water. Uh, well, I, I think that Colorado occurrence has been uh, studied and interpreted as as uh, po possibly fresh water or near shore marine. Yeah, definitely. So okay. you know that may you know a different environment may have been the place where where true fish really got got going, and and uh, that was present in the in the Ordovician at that time. Um, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. I have, I have a question on the, the brachiopods. Sure. I've seen very little, I mean, evidence of the predatory, predatory holes in many of the fossils of brachiopods. Why mm -hmm. do you think there's such a, I mean, and maybe it's just that I haven't seen them in very many of the um, images or, you know, yeah. fossil images. Yeah. Uh, like uh, bo boreholes, drill holes. Right. Yeah. Well, those those become a lot more common in younger younger uh, parts of the fossil record uh, when you had uh, snails that were capable of of drilling, uh, like uh, moon snails, uh, burrowing moon snails that that uh, get their prey that way. Um, and in the Cincinnati, and there there have been some circular boreholes found in things. Uh, I don't have much experience with it, but some people have described these, they do exist. You know, what was doing that boring? Um, those snails, those cyclonema, um, they could have had some boring capability using their radula the way uh, other snails eventually did. Uh, the cyclonema are often found associated with the crinoids, like the specimen I showed. Uh, they are also found as free snails, gastropods. A member of our dry <laughs> excuse me, our dry dredger, Steve Felton, who passed away a few years ago, an incredible fossil collector and an astute observer of what he found. Uh, was very keen on cyclonema, and he was a great specialist on those, and and uh, uh, studied the association of uh, cyclonema with with the crinoids, uh, and you know they probably had habits that were not just confined to attaching onto onto crinoids, but um, they're quite common in the Cincinnati. There are other snails. I, I'm afraid I, I didn't do justice to the, the snails, the gastropods. There are some that are more limpet-like. There are some that are like the, the, yeah, the monoclocophorans that still exist today. They're kind of like a limit, a limpet. Uh, we even have Ordovician um, uh, 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 chitons, titans. The, the valve shell that is formed by the chitin uh, that, that has a, a foot that it crawls on and attaches. Uh, very important in modern faunas. Those 
go back to the Cincinnatian, so too do the, the scaphopods, the tusk shells that are that are uh, living uh, burrowed in the sediment and and uh, you know suck water in and, and feed like that. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of things that I, you know, I left out that maybe they don't occur in the Cincinnatian, but but uh, they they should, certainly could have been part of the story. Uh, getting yeah, getting back to the jellyfish. Um, well, from other parts of the world, there, I guess there, there are Ordovician jellyfish that are there are definitely undoubted jellyfish. I mean, hey, I mean, look at the Mazan. Uh, uh, creek uh, biota uh, with lots of jellyfish um, you, you know were just were described by by many workers just beautifully beautifully preserved I mean jellyfish were around and you know they would have been part of the the uh, mobile predators or or plankton feeders as well but you know I think we're kind of stuck with a, a lack of knowledge of what was the whole base of the food chain, even those, you know, those acrotarchs were there, probably abundant, but but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything like the 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 uh, kind of organic soup of later later seawater um, uh, environments, uh, as I showed you, and and I, I think there's a lot more we need to learn about the evolution and history of the plankton in the sea. I'm interested a lot in this for the uh, Carboniferous to the Mississippian and what what uh, what the uh, sources of food were uh, at that time too. Because I mean, the the Paleozoic, what we see in the Cincinnati becomes very typical of the entire Paleozoic marine fossil record uh, throughout the world. I mean, it's it's the beginnings of great diversification. We know that Cincinnati is part of a Ordovician uh, uh, radiation of, of fossil fossil uh, producing uh, organisms, invertebrates. And, and this is just the beginning of a big Paleozoic story. But I, I, I really think that the, you know, the Paleozoic marine ecology is really different than what came later. And I, I think we've got a lot to understand about the nature of the the marine ecology of the Paleozoic, and of course that's factors in you know what led to mass extinctions. We have a big extinction at the end of the uh, Ordovician, and then we've got a whole lot more in the Paleozoic, and a lot of these you know forms are big big uh, uh, components of the marine fauna in the Paleozoic. Uh, became extinct ultimately at the end of the the Paleozoic and the Permo, uh, late Permian extinctions. The crinoids almost go out completely. Uh, you know things like the Edrioasteroids. A lot of these groups are are gone. The the corals that I showed you uh, are Paleozoic restricted forms, and new things take over. But but we can still learn a lot from the living counterparts or the an analogous forms, not necessarily the direct descendants of the early faunas, but things that have adopted the same life habits uh, and the, the same uh, morphology. Uh, I think it's, you know, the, the present remains a key to the past, but the past also informs what we understand about how the present evolved, okay? So. Dave, uh, yeah. uh, I uh, graduated the uh, University of Dayton um, Yeah. 84 uh, with a geology degree. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering if you knew any of the professors there. Uh, oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, Dan Gold Goldman. Goldman, no, I, he, he must not have been there uh, in 84, but Charles Ritter. Okay, yeah. Uh, not too well, but but the, the, there have been people there that that uh, like Goldman uh, work on uh, uh, graptolites, huh. right? And and the I didn't I really gave them really short shrift. Uh, graptolites were both uh, free free floating planktonic forms and also bottom dwelling benthic forms, colonial forms, 
And they too, they too were filter feeders. The, the graptolite animal is pretty well known. Uh, you know, again, another uh, group feeding on some very small prey or, or food sources, part, or particulate matter or actual living plankton. I mean, I mean, what, you know, what was the zooplankton like? I mean, we've talked about the phyto, possibly the phytoplankton, but what was, you know, you, you, you talk about the consumer level of the food, food chain, the food pyramids. And, and we've, we've jumped right into a lot of uh, large animals, invertebrates. And, and what about things like modern zo zooplankton, like the copepods? I mean, all those things didn't come along until much, much later in time. And, and, uh, and yet, you know, there's, you have to realize that a lot of planktonic forms might not have left a, a good fossil record at all. They could have been uh, soft bodied, just uh, virtually unpreservable. And we've just got to remember that a lot of, you know, that goes for the jellyfish too. They're just not going to be preserved. You have to keep in mind that a lot of things we see today just are not going to leave a fossil record. We have to understand what, what the biases of preservation are. And paleontologists have devoted a lot of attention to that over, over many years and still do. I think it's, it's very important. Yeah. Any other questions? Or? I I have a question on the um, two things on that on the trilobite that you showed with the um, within a burrow. Yeah. The first question is, what made you determine that the trilobite was the predatory and not the worm? Not, not the worm. Good. Very, very good question. Well, OK. Um, well, the. The worm burrow is located where it it it, it is you know, right where the mouth of the tri the, the trilobite's mouth was under the front end of its head shield, its cephalon, and you know it, it really looks as if the trilobite was digging down into the sediment, and and it, it, you it it cut off the worm in its burrow. That's what it looks like. So okay. we interpreted it that way. And let me see, there was evidence of scratch marks on the worm burrow that were possibly created by the appendages of the trilobite. Because we remember that we, the, the trilobite appendages are almost never preserved. Right. And yet those are the primary uh, equipment they've got to, to get food and to consume it. Um, and I mean, the, you know, the isotelus, the, there are actually specimens that have preserved appendages. And then if you think of another trilobite that's in the Cincinnati triarthrus, uh, those have been found not here, but from New York State where the appendages, the soft appendages are preserved. They were described by Beecher, very famous uh, beds equivalent to the Cope, the Utica Shales of New York. Uh, and they've studied those with, with uh, X-ray uh, uh, examination and have revealed beautiful details of these things. And now, now we've got micro CT scanning that reveals a lot of uh, soft part anatomy of, of things that, that have not been studied. And so, uh, um, you know, we, we're, we're getting to know a lot more about trilobite appendages and uh, especially I, I talked about those hypostomes. Those, those are, I think, very instructive structure, instructive structures to, to examine to find out what what uh, the different forms are and you know how they might have been used by the trilobite. I mean the the hypostome on uh, Flexicolimines is a, a little shield like thing. A little it, it, there's there's quite a lot of study of the the forms and the diversity of trilobite hypostomes that you might want to. I could suggest papers uh, that that uh, go into that, and um, we have a collector in Ohio. Uh, Steve Brown, 
a very a excellent collector of trilobites. And he has, he has studied the hypostomes in, in the different trilobites in the Ordovician. And it, they're very diverse, which seems to point towards different different ways in which the trilobites were using them. So, you know, when you get into that that bow plan aspect of the the eco space, if you will, um, that that you know that points to great diversity at a lower at taxonomic level. The the mega guild is is putting you know whole groups into these these spaces in the diagram and um, it, it's it's pretty a pretty coarse analysis, let's say, coarse grained analysis. Okay. <laughs> so the other question I had was on the trace burrow around the um, trilobite. Yeah. And and this is just a general, I found myself wondering how many collectors have not realized it was a burrow and removed it thinking it was just matrix. Same with the, the worm burrow. And yeah. even the, um, the, the encrusted parts of you know the brachial pods i mean i probably have removed it thinking it was just matrix yeah. and and i wonder yeah. how many how many have had that happen uh i, mean, just I would in, say it's probably quite frequent i mean those you know those structures around the brachial pods not everybody agrees with vendatillo and me on that uh people think it's was produced by scour by currents it's not, I just do not think it's a scour. We, we can basically prove that. I mean, Dottillo has done some elegant research with the brachiopods where he found, um, he found evidence that the brachiopods were actually actively burrowing or escaping being buried by a storm. And uh, he he found this first, and you know the there's a small brack called Sarbiella mm -hmm. that is found in the Ordovician, uh, much smaller than our Raffinescinus, but the same type of thing. And he found uh, uh, Sarbiellas that had been buried, he you know uh, in a a, a sediment um, movement of some type. And that they showed a trace where they they by probably moving the valves. I mean, we we th we think that the the even the raffinescent is if they were covered by a storm uh, produced uh, sediment flow burial that they could they could basically clap the valves and get themselves out. They could do escape burrows. And in, in a paper we we published in in two thousand nine. Uh, we looked at at um, evidence for these these uh, these uh, moats to 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 have been a an actual uh, part part of a, a burrow that, that that had more more to it than that. So so yeah, I think you're right that that happens, and people need to to look at uh, the sediment around your fossils, and is is there evidence of any life activities? And and uh, what you know what it might have been. Uh, I mean, the whole trace. I, I didn't beyond that. There was nothing else on trace fossils here, but but you know we learned from trace fossils tremendous things about the life habits of the organisms. They are the record of behavior. So feeding is a big thing about this, and and you know that that's that's just absolutely fascinating. I mean, the Cincinnati and there could be a whole program on the trace fossils. And and we had the beginnings of that uh, with with uh, Dick Osgood and his mentor Kenneth Castor mm. who was studying this stuff back in the 30s. He was studying how trace fossils are formed, tracks that were thought to be vertebrate amphibian tracks. Castor showed that they were formed by horseshoe crabs crawling, and that was back. He was doing experiments with these horseshoe crabs. Uh, to find out what kind of uh, tracks they might leave. And by golly, they're very similar to a lot of things that were thought to be um, small amphibian tracks. No, they weren't, so. So what do you, what do you suppose yeah. this is? I found this near Cincinnati. Oh, uh, hmm. 
Okay, is is it a uh, well? You 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 can find a lot of internal molds of cephalopods. It's probably a body chamber mold, um, and a lot of those will still have the the uh, the septa, or they the, if it's the body chamber it would just be a solid thing like you've got there, and I can't see the details on it. Okay, yeah, it doesn't. It's just solid. It doesn't have uh, yeah. the yeah. fibers. So yeah, yeah, this probably yeah. came from a big cephalopod. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, some of those, you know, were huge. Mm -hmm. We don't. Some in the Cincinnati and probably were a meter. There, there are specimens in the collections, and were were really big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, yeah, it looks it looks like probably a, an in, yeah yeah a filling, and then you see what could happen is that the actual shell was not preserved, and the the internal filling might have been petrified, and that's what you that's what you end up with. You know, we we find those those things have got uh, fossils on them, like trilobites or other things that probably lived inside an empty shell and got trapped in there, buried, and are preserved. They're pretty pretty amazing too. Wow, I never would have thought to look inside. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, we've got some some uh, internal molds of cephalopods that have uh, got entire entire trilobite, even larger trilobites like Flexicolimines, on them. And so, you know, you probably had the empty shell being a place the trilobite crawled in for shelter and then got buried somehow. Yeah, the, and so there's all these neat things about life habits that we can we can um, interpret from careful collecting and observation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good questions, folks. I'll... Point, I'm gonna end our recording and okay. open up the floor to anything and anything. So if you wanna hang around, Dave, for more questions, or if you want to uh, just participate in a conversation from this point, be my guest. Well, I, I can hang around. I'll take any more questions that are, that are burning